Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. I've got my distinguished panel with me today, Steve Dehaw, Arthur Swartz, and Blake Morris. And we're going to continue our conversation about um, George Santos. Last time we spoke, we kind of talked a little bit about the role of the press and the role of the party. Since then, the... Um, the news media has made such a, like a hysterical, hysterical uh, portrait of him where every day there's a new lie. So, but, you know, and people are laughing. People think it's funny. Like Steve said, this is not only a national issue, but it's an issue all over the world. I, I, find, that, I find that so hard to believe. But... Going back to the original thought is we might be here, but many people don't know how we got here. And let's uh, give a little synopsis of how we got here. Uh, you know, you guys talked about the role of the, the press and the role of the parties. One thing I got to say, uh, Steve, your friend, Robert Zimmerman was saying, well, he didn't have enough money to wage a campaign against um, against uh, Santos because he blew it all on the primary. Do you think that was a cop out? Uh, I, you know, Robert, I, I like Robert. He's, he's a good guy. He's a friend. Um, I, I think they just made strategic mistakes. Um, and, um, you know, we do that. I, I made strategic mistakes in my race two years ago. Um, hopefully I learned and I won't do them again this year. But um, I, to say he didn't have money, I, I don't think is, is a valid excuse. I think that um, they spent tons of money. He had television commercials going around. Um, you know, he, I, see, I saw him speak. Because, again, I was running, I was managing an assembly campaign that, 60% of my assembly district I was managing um, covered the third district. And I saw Robert all the time. He never mentioned it. I mean, it doesn't cost you anything to go make a speech and say, by the way, this guy is not who he says he is. And mm -hmm. I never heard that. And, and we said it in our previous uh, um, meetings that you we've all had here together, that if it was, I think, any one of us, we would have said it every time we were on the stump. Every time we were on the stump, till someone paid attention, and uh, so you know, not having money, it just uh, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, and I I don't, and I don't know. I you know, wasn't f focused on what Zimmerman did. I I did. I was working with somebody in the primary, um, uh, Melanie Dorigo, who came in second, I believe, but. Uh, and part of what she complained about is that Zimmerman had much more money than her. Than her. <laughs> uh, the uh, I I I want to say two things because I think between the last time we spoke and now I I actually had a meeting the um, the state Democratic chair Jay Jacobs came to the New York the Manhattan we call it we don't call it the New York County Democratic Party we call it the Manhattan Democratic Party. So I'm on the executive committee as a district leader. And um, so Jay came <clears throat> withering questions, withering questions, right? But one of his one of his excuses for why the, the party lost four races is we we shouldn't have the primaries. We shouldn't be primarying people. We should, you know, mm -hmm. agree on a candidate and not primary people. Um, and I, I think that's BS uh, because he he's basically saying the party needs to pick somebody like the Republicans do. And uh, uh, instead of looking at the primary as as a place to test out ideas and see what resonates, you know, most clearly with 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 the voters. And so so I don't I don't buy the. I, I had to run a primary, therefore I, I didn't have enough money to run in the run in the general. Um, but the second is there was something wrong with the part with the message. Did, what what could possibly have Santos's message have been? Uh, 
and maybe Steve, you could you could tell us if you live near that area um, that Zimmerman somehow lost. He didn't say what people wanted to hear. He didn't talk about issues that people wanted to hear. And yes, opposition research is one thing, but still he lost to a guy who the time before had gotten like what, uh, uh, against Swazi had gotten what, 20% of the vote. Um, and what what was wrong with his message? And if he runs again, you know, and, and not if, you know there's gonna be a, another election and it's just kind of pathetic that Santos is for people that live there to have a congressman, you know, who's who's kind of a running joke, um, but who's going to vote on important issues, most of which are going to be, well, he's, he certainly gets to vote on the debt ceiling question, um, if that ever comes up for a vote or when that comes up for a vote. But um, what what message, you know, it's likely that Zimmerman will be the candidate again, and what does he what has he learned that he has to say against who the next candidate is going to be um who i hear is likely to be this um black um woman is she ethiopian um of of a uh who's you mean be... against against um santos no, no, no. Santos is going to wind up having to resign because Santos is going to get in, Santos. He's going to get indicted. I mean, I think we all going to get indicted on. I mean, every day, resign, every day there's a, get indicted. Every day there's a new new story about where he got his money from, about uh, you know for, uh, his violation of federal campaign finance laws, false reporting. I mean, he's going to get it. You know, this this Ponzi scheme thing that he was involved in in the Bronx. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's a matter of weeks, if not months, right, before he gets indicted. And will he stay in Congress after he's indicted? You know, Collins did that in the 27th in New York, the old 27th that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. he, he stayed in Congress until until his um, until his his uh, plea bargain and gave up as part of his plea bargain, he gave up his seat um, so that. Santos will probably do the same thing as Mike is, but at some point there'll be there'll be uh, a, a, a primary, and I want to know what Zimmerman learned, other than oh, I need to do better opposition research. Blake, I think Robert Zimmerman, and we should, and I don't know what to, we should call him. Robert, should we call him Zimmerman? Should we call him fail candidate? I don't know what to call him. Hey, what about Bob Dylan? Right. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that <laughs> I'm sorry that went over my head. But Robert, but Dylan's Dylan's uh you know oh. birth name was Robert Zimmerman. Oh right. Oh okay. <laughs> we could call, we could call By the way, I, I had a cousin named Robert Zimmerman who actually had the same birthday as Bob Dylan. But, oh my god. So anyway. That's amazing. So I don't think I don't think Zimmerman has <laughs> learned anything. I, I think he had a really bad message. I don't think he's a very good campaigner. I, you know, my only interaction was, was with him or only experience with him, I should say, is watching him on that Zoom call with his volunteers a couple of, um, you know, last month. And he was non-apologetic and he said he had raised $2 million. Steve, you know how much he raised? I don't know how much he raised, but he said he raised over $2 million. And he said he, could, he, he was busy raising money and not, and he couldn't have time to deal with the Santos issue. And he told Jay Jacobs, and so, and he told the reporters, and he saw there was press on it, and then he just didn't bother telling his volunteers or his staff. And he said, if I couldn't get the county chair or the state chair to listen to me, I couldn't get reporters to listen to me. Why would I? actually quote unquote why should I take my time to spend my time telling putting out a message that people are not receptive to hear wow incredible Steve I you know it didn't seem like Zimmerman had a money problem and um and I've said it all along I think the the problem in the Nassau County Democrats um, from the higher up, whether it was Zimmerman's campaign or was Kathy Hochul's campaign, was a lack of, of a field operation. And I think that 
um, that probably had something to do with too. If you're not on the ground talking to people, people aren't going to get your message. And yeah, you also can't tell them that the guy you're running against is a fraud. And if you're spending your money on, you know, fluffy television commercials, um, it, you're never going to get those that word out. And I think that um, I think that's really what it was. I mean, we're all making everybody's making excuses now. Um, you know, there's no reason if you knew there's no reason if you knew this stuff that you didn't scream from top of your lungs every single day. Did did Tom Swazi know? And if if he did, why didn't he say anything? Well, I, I can. I've heard Tom talk about this. Um, Tom, they didn't know, but um, you got to remember two two things. One was when Tom ran. Um, Santos was a guy making fifty five thousand dollars a year who had no assets and no campaign funds. And everybody knew he was, uh, to use Tom's word, and I've used the same word, a kook. So they didn't really take, pay much attention to the guy because um, it, there was no chance of him winning that year. Um, I think Tom, Tom said they knew they had their polling. They were going to do well. Um, so they focused on their campaign. You know, two years later, this guy is worth, you know, what, tens of millions of dollars loaning his campaign $700,000 saying he you know had this great background and worked for the finest uh financial institutions in the united states had went to schools had great degrees um you know it was it was a different story it was also a different time politically i mean i felt that red wave coming in nassau county uh having running a, a campaign there um so it was a different you know i always like to say two years in politics is a generation and it was here, you know, Swazi's race versus Santos was completely different than uh, Zimmerman's race versus Santos two years later. Wow. So um, Santos ultimately won, you know, despite all of the uh, stuff that went on, he won. OK, so he he's now seated in Congress. And McCarthy's majority is so small that he needs Santos. Do you think Santos is, is um, a hindrance to the nation? Steve, what do you think? Um, you know, Santos is, I don't know if he particularly is a, is a danger to the nation. I just don't know who... I don't know whose money he's got. I don't know who's backed him. Um, that's the scary part. Because uh, and what it shows, what it shows on the one hand is that it's pretty easy to buy a congressional seat. I mean, if you're a billionaire, if you're an oligarch, I mean, you can you, know, you can play with the rules here and get somebody in in Congress that is your puppet. And then frankly. You know, we saw it happen with the presidency, too, with, with the Russians, you know, having influence and putting Trump in back in 2016. So that's the first scary part. The, the second scary part is even, frankly, more scary, is that, like, Santos just fits in with the rest of the, the crazy kooks in the congressional, uh, you know, Republican congressional caucus there. I mean, you know, he fits right in with, with Matt Gates and and but, uh, but what was what was he saying to people, Steve? Uh, you know, like I wasn't paying attention to that race, right? Uh, what was he saying that got him so many votes? Well, I don't know if it was that he said anything. He was uh, that was different than any other Republican. I mean, he was towing the you know the crazy Republican line. I mean, he doesn't say anything that's much different than Lauren Boebert or uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, he was carrying the the crazies lines. And unfortunately, out on Long Island, um, there was a red wave. And um, he just rode that wave. It, it wasn't, it wasn't like, Arthur, it wasn't as if this guy was this charismatic leader that suddenly everybody was coming by. It wasn't, he wasn't a demagogue. He was just in the right place at the right time, uh, saying 
the the right things. You know, you you just said something important, Steve. He was in the right place at the right time. You know, people might think that he's an anomaly, but really, is he? Is he an anomaly? He's well, he's a kook. I mean, in, in the the unfortunately, in the Republican Party, um, you know, the lunatics are running the asylum. Blake, what do you think? Oh, that's such a great question. Because I think the answer is he's not an anomaly. And at the same time, he is. So he's not an anomaly that he's a fraud. And we have many people running for Congress and actually who get elected to Congress who are known frauds. So when Kevin, Mc when the House, when the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, said that it's not a big deal, he fluffed his, re he fluffed his resume. That's what everyone does here, quote unquote. So, and the reality is that most of the Congress people actually have fluffed their resume, and they're and they've and they've done and they've done it to the extreme. Of course, Santos has taken that completely off the charts. There's no, there's no connection to it. That's why he's the, you know, he's the um, point of ridicule you know, on TV and social media and everywhere because it's so extreme. It's just, it's 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 easy to poke fun at. And I think I didn't know about uh, Zimmerman's TV ads, but I, but part of this is because Zimmerman was on television. People saw Zimmerman and they said, I don't want you. So part of this is that um, I didn't see any campaign lit, but whatever I've heard about the Santos campaign is he didn't say, as, as Steve was saying, he didn't say anything different than any other stock Republican around the country. He just read the talking points. But what he did do was because he lied about his bio. He, he actually appealed to, to almost every special interest group within NY3. So, you know, if you want me to be rich, I'm rich. You want me to be a donor to your charity, I'm a donor to a charity. You want, me, you want me to help out pets, I'm a pet helper. You want me to be connected to Holocaust victims, I'm, 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 I'm also connected to Holocaust victims. You want me to be gay, I'm gay. You want me, you know, so everything, every little group that, that people wanted to see if they could connect to him, he said, oh, I'm part of that group, too. OK, Arthur, what do you think? Um, I, I, I still. I mean, yes, Republic that there are a lot of kook, kooks in office, the Republicans, but mo most most of them, most of the, I mean, the kooks are the ones that get in the press. Uh, the kookiest ones get in the get in the press. You know, the others are sort of like McCarthy. He's not a kook, right? He's a he's he has a very conservative agenda that um, I don't totally understand. This there's an interesting article today. Where where was it? Um, in, in the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal is an article. Can the Republican Party become the party of the working class? Which is absurd. It's absurd. But the fact of the matter is that they get a lot of white working class voters. A lot, a lot. And Hispanic working class voters. Uh, and Asian and, 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 now and, and Asian working class voters. And uh, Asian all classes. And um, Somehow they're doing that by painting the Democratic Party as a party of elites. And I just I just saw an article this morning of Beach Burn gave talking about how somehow Democrats represent 23 of the most of the 25 most wealthy districts in the country because white elites support the Democrats. Um, there, are, there are plenty of, you know, yes, they have the Koch brothers on the, on the Republican side, but the strategy of the Democratic Party, the strategy of the Republican Party, even though they don't really believe it, is to say things that appeal to working class people, which is more like, you know, we care about your issues. Um, and you pay too much taxes, you have too much crime. Uh, <clears throat> you don't have enough say in the control of your schools. Um, 
and and somehow the democrats the, the democratic party doesn't totally get that and is and my my guess this district that that santos won right it's largely working a working class middle class i don't like the word middle class but you know it's it's a it's not it's not a wealthy district right it's a north the north the north side of nassau county and and south eastern queens right it's Basically. um it's it's the the north shore of of nassau county and then it goes into eastern queens Right, Eastern Queens. So, yeah, but not, but, but not below the Grand Central or the Expressway. So it's still in, nor in northeastern Queens. Yeah, so, I mean, I think yeah, it could be. No, I think we call that more Eastern Queens. I think once you get kind of south of uh, Little Neck, Douglaston, you kind of call it like areas like New Hyde Park, Floral Park, Glen Oaks. We kind of see them as Eastern. Eastern. So it's it's largely yeah. white working class. It's working class people who have better jobs. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I, I, I think it's it's actually it's it's middle to upper middle. Right, but I'm and, talking, and, and you do it's have not, some. It's not business owners. It's not people working. Oh, no, it is. No, oh, no, no, it, it is. is. It's it, oh, it, it is. It very is. much is. You, uh, you've um, got you're going into the Gold Coast. You've got the the extremely wealthy areas extremely. in that district too. Uh, um, up in uh, you know the North Shore, the Gold Coast. But I'm talking about the vast majority of people that it's interesting because that the reason i don't like using the word middle class is like i represent i represent the union at national grid the average worker at national grid these are blue collar people makes eighty thousand bucks the union's done a great job over the last 30 years 80 they make eighty thousand bucks right the people that answer the phones to take your complaint or or to talk to you about your bill Make ninety thousand dollars a year. Wow! Um, wow! And but these are working class people, right? They st they still scrape by, because because you know um, if they want their kid to go to college or if they you know they their mortgage rates are going up or whatever it is, they, they don't think of themselves as they don't identify with with people that I live in. I live in uh, in Greenwich Village. The younger people here that people that are still working as opposed to retirees you know work on wall street different different i mean they're they're not they're they're not business owners but they're not they don't identify with you know they actually vote democratic but, uh Arthur, i would guess that the the average home in that district is probably close to a million dollars right but most people right so so they have to have a mortgage if they want to buy it, uh, right. if they want to move into it. Right. But so, so some, have, somebody's sorry. missing. Somebody's missing a connection. Uh, is whatever Zimmerman did, he's missing. It, he missed a connection. He's somehow missing a connection. And I think those two districts that the the four districts that the Democrats lost, right, is like Westchester, Rockland, Nassau, Suffolk, right. It's those suburban districts, mostly white, uh, <clears throat> better paid working class, you know, um, and somehow the, the, the message of the Democratic Party wasn't resonating with that. Question. I'm, I'm gonna, okay, Question. I was, I was going to say something, and, it, and it's, it's probably a little controversial, but I think that... Um, you know, I certainly believe in diversity. I live in an extremely diverse area. You know, my I grew up in a diverse house where my mother and my father had practiced different <laughs> religions. Um, I'm, I'm married to a Haitian immigrant. So, I mean, I'm all about diversity. But I think that um, we have a part of our, um, a part of our Democratic Party that has kind of forsaken middle class white people. And, you know, I, I hear just me, I'm, I'm running for a city council and I'm running in a district that is very diverse. And I was speaking to someone at yesterday or a couple of days ago, and she said, why do you want to run? You know, you're a white guy. And I think that 
there are people in the Democratic Party that think that way. And um, the problem that we run into, and, and it's especially relevant in presidential elections and in other states for Senate races, you know, it, the, the people, especially with social media, how things spread now, you know, that, you know, white family of, of factory workers in Erie, Pennsylvania, hears that. The coal miners um, in, in West Virginia and in Kentucky, the family of a white coal mining family who's struggling to get by because the coal mine just went bankrupt. They hear that too. And there's this unfortunate feeling in a lot of working and middle-class you know, white areas that they don't care about me. Yet, it, realistically, we're the party that cares about schooling for your kids. We're the, the party that cares that you have health care. We're the party that cares that, um, you know, we're going to make, make sure that you have the opportunity to move up. And we're going to not, you know, tax you. We want to, you know, have a fair tax code. But that message doesn't get out when someone's telling me I shouldn't run for my district because I'm white. I got a couple of questions. The um, state chairman, Nick Langworthy, ran for Congress and he won. Was anybody minding the store on the Republican side? Well, actually, well, actually, they were because from the New York Times reporting, we have that it was um, at least uh, Stefanik's campaign staff that was actually putting up Santa, that was actually running um, Santos's campaign before the general election. And so her Stefanik's campaign staff asked the Republican National, asked the consent of Santos and he gave it to have the RNC run a background check on Santos before they gave him their, their million dollars or, or $1.2 million, whatever they gave it, him in campaign contributions. And halfway through that campaign research, they came out with most of what we know today about Santos as being a fraud and a liar. Stefanik's campaign staff resigned from Santos's campaign. The remaining campaign staff signed non-disclosure agreements with the agreement that the RNC would complete their background search. So the RNC had a complete background search. The Stefanik staffers did not sign NDAs. They had resigned knowing all the facts, but they didn't tell anybody. And the RNC would have gave Santos the money, circulated that circulated the, in, the the background search to the to the county chair and to everyone else. So everyone in leadership in the in, in the Republican Party at the national, state, and county level would have known exactly what we now know today. But they were stuck. And if you listen to the county chairman of Nassau County, I forgot his name, but if you listen to that Nassau County Republican Republican chairman, um he says we were stuck with Santos. The special master switched up the district at the last minute. Santos had run when they thought Zimmerman was going to win the election. And then they switched it up at the last minute. And, and the only one in the Republican primary was Santos. Wow. Steve, you have anything to say about that? Well, I, I think Blake really covered it well. And the bottom line of this is that they knew. I mean, it's pretty obvious from the... New York Times reporting that the Republicans knew, the higher ups knew that this guy was a fraud. And uh, from what I've read and, and heard people talking about was it was a joke amongst them. I mean, they were, were laughing behind the scenes at how much of a fraud this guy actually was. And no one had the courage to say anything. I'd like to think if I was a Democrat and, and I saw someone like that, I was to expose them. So do you think that the Democratic Party was too focused on making sure that Kathy Hochul won a full term? Um, because she was kind of, it was kind of iffy. Uh, Selden was really closing in on her. So do you think the fact that the Democratic Party put all of its resources into Hochul rather than spreading it out and 
maybe helping Zimmerman. What do you think? I can talk about that on a personal level. And I've, we've said this before in, in our other in other Zooms. Um, Kathy Hochul had no ground game in Nassau County you know, on Long Island at all. And um, they, you know, when Kathy came to, the governor came to Long Island, she'd have these rallies at various different candidates for assembly for the Senate. And it was the same 150 people at these rallies. <laughs> Yet um, I had reached out to her campaign to coordinate canvassing in the 19th assembly district in Nassau, where I was working. And I was told, and I quote, we're not canvassing Nassau. So I think that's more important. I think that they didn't have a ground game out in Long Island. And I don't know if they had given up out there. I don't know if they thought, okay, we're not gonna take this area. We're gonna go into Brooklyn where we really need those votes. Um, I'm not sure, but they had no ground game. Do you think that uh, from their perspective, Zimmerman was uh, a shoe in more or less? They thought that Zimmerman was winning. Okay. I, I have no doubt they thought that Zimmerman was going to win. Um, we in the, the Sanjeev Jindal's race in the 19th, we felt that red wave coming. And, and we did everything we, we could to fight it. We, we sent out as much mail as we could. We hit as many doors as we could. But, you know, we were a small assembly race um, that, you know, struggled a little bit to, to raise money. I think that people kind of saw it as a, as a Republican seat, even though I think that um, in the right year with a good campaign, Democrats could take that seat. But um, it was... I think from the Hochul standpoint, they weren't putting money out there. And I think maybe they were maybe they were where, where Arthur is and where where Blake is in Manhattan and in Brooklyn, but they certainly weren't in Nassau. They they were spending money. I don't know what they I know they I think hers was the most expensive governor campaign ever in in the history of the United States. Like fifty million. She spent fifty million. Oh my no, god. Fifty million dollars. And <laughs> So, on a, in, in, I mean, there were, must have been a lot of consultants. Steve, you and I, when in our, if we wear our consultant hats, we missed a, <laughs> we missed out on a big one. <laughs> so ineffective. The consultants made a lot of money, but um, it was just just so ineffective. And it, and it, I mean, I, I don't watch. If it if it focused mainly on television ads, which I think is what it did. Yeah. Um. um and it was all on abortion, 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 abortion. But that's well, all I thought. I, I, I can <laughs> tell you, um, you know, Sanjeev, who, who I was managing his campaign, he had four prime voters in his house. Plus, his son had just turned 18, so he was registered as a new voter. So you had five voters. If you're, to me, if you're running a campaign that you got to talk to, right? And no one from Kathy Hochul's campaign and no one from Robert Zimmerman's campaign ever knocked on his door. Wow. So Santos is in Congress right now. <laughs> he doesn't have many friends. Uh, nobody's really hanging out with him. He's not hanging out with anybody else. All I ever see him is walking down the halls, the press is trying to ask him questions and he's avoiding it. Ultimately, what do you think is going to happen? Um, Blake? I think what's going to happen is that one of the prosecutors currently investigating him are going to indict him pretty soon because he has no I mean, he has no facts. He just he just switched up his campaign filings on Thursday or Friday, where he said that personal loan um, didn't really exist, and that the money. Well, what did he do? He said the personal loan for the five hundred or six hundred thousand or seven hundred thousand dollars didn't exist, 
and he knocked it down to a $125,000 loan, but not from him, but from, some, but from some unknown third party. So he's basically, so now he's just admitted violating all these campaign um, rules and laws and ethics in Congress. And the, there was an electronic digital stamp of a treasurer, which is basically this, the default treasurer for Republicans in Congress, but that person came forward and issued a press release saying that, that, his, that his digital signature was misused and without his authority. So not mm -hmm. only did they switch, switch up their, his campaign filings, but they also now he doesn't even have a campaign treasurer. Mm -hmm. And he has 30, and the rid of the FEC has sent Santos's campaign letters, five camp, he has five campaign entities. So now they've sent um, Santos a letter with the five campaign entities that he has 30 days to find himself a treasurer. Mm. Arthur? What's the question again? What, How long before he's going to happen? Somewhere in the next, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, these kind of, I don't know whether the, the DAs or the U.S. attorney who moves faster. Uh, Sometimes these guys move very slowly. Um, sometimes they move quickly. Somewhere probably in the next six months could take that long. Um, somebody indicts him. And then probably if one entity indicts him the next day, the other will, right? He'll, he'll get federal charges and state and state charges. More likely federal charges. He ran for Congress. There's a lot of federal jurisdiction over, over what he did. Um, there's, um, <clears throat> although, um, I mean, there are state laws involved here. If he was involved in some kind of Ponzi scheme, but there were people, there were people arrested in this Ponzi scheme thing that they didn't include him. Um, and, uh, so I don't know if they go back on that one or they just use the campaign finance stuff. And that's a, you know, campaign finance violations can be very powerful tools for the U.S. attorney um, if they use it, right? Um, the, the, we, ha, we once had a trial of the Speaker of the State Senate not too long ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago, Bruno. He was, he'd been the Speaker, the Republican Speaker of the State Senate, and he had campaign finance violations, and they he got indicted on. He actually got acquitted, but that was the end of his career right um and uh, you know i've sometimes it isn't i think it's, uh, the, the, the um <clears throat> the senator from new jersey had campaign finance violations and he beat you know he won the trial and didn't resign um so whether santos tries to to fight it or doesn't fight it or um you know my my Articles I've read say that he's not resigning because he wants to use it as a chess piece to get at, to save a jail term. Um, Steve? Uh, well, I think they both Blake and, and Arthur hit on, on really, really salient points here. Um, it's obvious, I think, that this guy has, um, that this guy has committed <laughs> uh, campaign finance fraud. Um, he's, as Blake said, he, he made up beyond everything he did before. Now he's made up a, a treasurer who isn't really his treasurer. There's also in the last couple of days been reports that some people that are listed as contributors to his campaign are now saying they've never given any money to him. So, I mean, he's in a boatload of trouble when it comes to campaign finance. And I would think that, you know, he will get indicted um, and probably convicted on that because it seems pretty obvious that there's criminality here. But Arthur said something also that was really important. Um, when, if he resigns, he has no bargaining chip. And um, him staying, it's, it's vital for him to stay in the Congress to basically say uh, when it comes to some sort of plea negotiations that you know, I will, instead of going away for 20 years, I'll go away for one or two years and I'll, you know, resign from my post. That over, over time, 
that uh, position uh, of an elected official has been used as bargaining chips to uh, bring down uh, plea agreements. And I think that he has to be thinking that. I mean, you, know, you, you it's just it's just highly logical that you know that's his only bargaining chip. And if he gives that up, he has nothing. Uh, you know, he was clever enough during the campaign to appeal to the many different constituencies in his uh, in his district. But didn't he realize that that he would be found out and he would be facing criminal charges? What do you guys think? Blake? When you're, when you're a sociopath, and he is a sociopath, and, he, and he's probably many other things as well, but his, but his basic structural foundation is it being a sociopath, he, they never, the being, the being caught process is not even a possibility because that's what it is about, that's when you have a disease of, of being a sociopath, part of that disease is that you don't think you're doing anything wrong. Wow. So, wow. In, so, so in his mind, in his mind, people are just out to get him. So this is, you know, this is where the paranoia comes in, but he doesn't think he's done anything um, improper. You know, the, this, um, there's not too many people that are speaking out on, on this issue. You know who I'd really love to hear from? Santos ex-wife. Has there been any talk about her being interviewed? Do you know anybody? No, it's complete radio silence on his ex-wife. Okay. And also, <laughs> and one more, one more thing, back, yeah. back to Arthur. And complete radio silence about Jay Jacobs and his involvement with Santos. Like it's an amazing thing that the no one, even after the Republican County Party did their whole little dog and pony show and they had the press sit on the floor, no one wanted to go to the Democratic County Chair and ask him what they were thinking. Arthur, did they ever do that? He has all kind. Of, well, I was at a meeting where people asked him that question, and uh, you know he had. He had a scripted excuse, um, and and you know it's just interesting. He, he came up to me at the end of this meeting and said, "Oh, Arthur, it's good to see you." Uh, you know, because I've been a d district leader for twenty five years, and um, and I was on state committee. And he he said, "Oh, give me a call. Let's talk." Da, da, da. So I I called. I left a message. Said, Here, there's my phone number. Give me a call back. I haven't gotten a call back. Uh, he you know. Uh, his he's he's circling his wagons um and to some extent you know hoping that the the fuss about santos takes pressure off of him you know um but but you know this he it, it's interesting he said he said at our meeting um well, some people are looking at this like a football coach a high school a college football coach you know you lose you lose the big game you get fired and so, yeah, <laughs> that happens all the time. Uh, and, um, you know, and then he, of course, he rejected that, that, that notion because of uh, um, all the wonderful things he's done elsewhere, you know, in, in, in the state. And, um, but he, he just has a million reasons why we lost mostly, and he falls back on the Zimmerman had to run a primary. And therefore he was weakened and, and instead, instead, and I guess I, I meant to say this before, I don't think there was an effort to engage. So say Zimmerman won the, in the primary and Melanie got 25% or 30% of the vote. Um, there was no effort to reach out to her, the constituency that, there was no effort to reach out to her campaign for uh, um, collaboration. There wasn't because Jay believes that that side of the party is 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 you know destructive and horrible. I mean, he actually said it at at, at our meeting, right? It's like he doesn't feel like he has to collaborate with people on the left, um, and you know, so so he loses a big swath of potential organizers. And I I pointed out to him, I I Pat Riley ran in Ulster. 
some of Ulster County um, and North. That that's just a, for those in New York City who think. Was Ulster it eighteen or nineteen? Nineteen. That, that okay. Thinks, it sounds like uh, you know the middle of the universe. It was a two-hour drive north of New York City, right? Mm -hmm. um, it goes Westchester. Above Westchester is uh, is Duchess, and above that is Ulster. Right. And, uh, and um. And Riley, I went out campaigning, and he his headquarters was swarming with union members from a various union, CWA 1199, from New York City, and Working Families Party people. And there was not a big effort by the party, but he won, and he won, right? He 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 appealed to, you know, and his campaign was a lot more about bread and butter issues that, that he he had the pulse of people in his neighborhood you know and um sean maloney who was the next district to the south um who had a gazillion five million dollars to spend on the race mm -hmm. uh, lost and uh didn't want any assistance from anybody he didn't try to patch up things when he he had a primary he pushed Mondeer Jones out, by the way, Mondeer Jones moved back into the 18th district. Um, although he's also, by the way, you should get him on Cynthia. So Mondeer moved back to the 18th district. I talked to him, I was, I, I supported his campaign and uh, when he ran in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, and, he, you know, he's clearly gonna run, but you know what he's doing for the next two years? He's a talking head on CNN. Um, right. We'll see if he, We'll see if he he escapes from the television world. He's a very, you know, good looking, uh, smart, um, uh, young, gay, black man. Uh, they like having that that personality on CNN. But anyway, um, Sean didn't want any help from, it was just television, 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 abortion, 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 abortion. And he lost a district that had been democratic. Uh, for a number of years, hmm. many years, huge number of years. So, do you think Biagi could have won if uh, Biagi beat um, Maloney? Against Lawler against Lawler. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, she, she, she risked it. You know, poor, poor. Uh, she should have stayed in the states. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what happened there. She, she like decided, you know, she, she they, they drew the, the original lines, drew her into, into the third, right? She would have been, she, and then uh, <laughs> it was, it was a bizarre redistricting because they drew this line that literally went up the shoreline of the Bronx. It was like one block in all the way up the Bronx. And then it went, you know, Queens over like the Throgsneck Bridge, went up the shoreline of the Bronx, and then opened up into like New Rochelle, Pelham, that area, and and included her in a district. Um, so they drew the lines to to give her the seat, to give her the opportunity to run for the in the third, and uh, which most people were very critical of her doing. And then when the judge redid it, then she was now she now was in AOC's district, uh, and um, I think was an she was living in AOC's district, and so then she moved where well, she was ready to move over to another district. So she would like risk this this carpet beggar, you know, um, uh, label. So I, I'm not sure that 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 she could have won or won. She, would she have won against Santos? It was carpet banger one way or the other. I think uh, it was a problem. One final. Go ahead. I was going to say, I didn't think that uh, Biagi would play in that district myself. That was my feeling when, um, even when she first was going to run in that Long Island, Queens, Bronx district. Um, I, I didn't think that she played uh, in that district. So um, that's just my opinion. Yeah. One last question, and this is important, I think. The uh, What do you think ultimately will happen to McCarthy? 
Um, he's skating on pretty thin ice right now. Ultimately, what do you think his fate is going to be? Ultimately, his fate is d decided in 2024 by whatever happens in this country and who the hell knows what's going to happen in two years. So you think he's going to hang on till 2004 with the 2024 with a slim majority in Congress is what you're saying? I mean, I don't unless there's a lot of resignations and deaths in between, he'll, you know, I mean, just look at it. Uh, Nancy Pelosi only had a four seat majority the last term. She she made it through right with a four seat majority and passed a lot of important legislation. Okay. Um, and McCarthy won't pass anything. Um, and, you know, he gets himself in the conversation and then we'll see what happens in 2024. And, and so much has to do with, you know, do we have a recession? Does the economy recover? Do prices go down? Do, you know, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the, what did uh, James Carville say? It's the economy stupid? Yep. It's still the economy stupid. Steve, what do you think? I think that he will serve for two years. I think that the Democrats, unless something changes um, in the geopolitical world or the economy suddenly does a 180 degree turn, um, I think that he'll serve a, uh, a very unaccomplished two years as speaker and be replaced by Hakeem Jeffries. Um, after two years, uh, they're not going to pass anything of of any consequence because they are not going to they're not going to do anything on a bipartisan uh, level. And so Democrats control the Senate and obviously Biden's in the White House. So um, I think he's doomed to uh, spend two inconsequential years as speaker. And, um, you know, he's basically I said it a couple of weeks ago. I mean, the. Uh, the the congressional the the House Republicans uh, have become a circus and uh, McCarthy's going to have trouble keeping all those clowns under the tent. So um, I think it'll be interesting to watch the next couple of years. Blake, I concur with um, Steve and Arthur, and I think we're going to see after the debt ceiling. Hopefully, it won't be a crisis. It might be a crisis, but after the debt ceiling issue is over, crisis or no crisis. Um, I see um, a series of confidence votes for the Speaker of the House. I think McCarthy will probably win all those um, confidence votes, but I think some of the some of the people who were reluctant to vote for him the first time are going to call the question because they changed the rules that any one member can call for a vote of confidence. Okay, so this is a saga that will be continued. Um, you've been listening to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. My distinguished panel has been Blake Morris, Arthur Swartz, and Steve Bihar. So as um, developments happen, I'd love to have you guys back on to share your thoughts. Uh, thanks, guys, for taking the time on a Sunday morning to be on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great day.